Sort of ironic, Mashu used this no uh, used this motion to I, I identify me for our 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 women's cup and AC shokai. But actually that's not my way of living. When you feel <laughs> when you feel that you are stressed with daily suffering such as shukatsu or such as uh, seminar examin examination or pursuing license such as uh, bo boogie, for example, we think uh, I think that it's personally okay to just go home and relax, enjoy your time out with your friends, play play whatever game you like, and this is precisely the type of thing that we support from their side, from our side of the house. We think ultimately, how you pursue your life should be up to this individual, how you pursue your satisfaction or way of, uh, uh, way of your happiness should be up to this individual, and we think that's what we respect from our side. That's why we are extremely proud to propose this motion. Two things in my speech. Firstly, why do people live? What should be like the purpose of life? Secondly, why this norm suppresses some pe majority of individuals and eventually make their lives miserable for the vulnerable individual on the ground? Before that, three levels of setup. Firstly, what, how, do we look at, uh, how do we look at social narrative debate? We think social narrative or norms doesn't exist for minute, uh, minute or specific part of population, but but we think it exists for people, uh, it exists for vast majority of individuals uh, and general individuals out there in society. And reality of these vast majority of population are not, uh, these people are not that strong enough to overcome this kind of suffering. They don't, uh, they don't, dis uh, they don't uh, like, they don't pursue life for career path or elite course, and they don't need, uh, they don't want to be, uh, they don't pursue for being lawyer, and they don't climb the, uh, they, uh, it's not necessarily their desire to climb, climb up the social ladder and be CEO. But secondly, what is our stance? We don't, su uh, we don't support like, decadence, we don't support people being super lazy and not working out. Uh, working not at, at all, because reasonably speaking, we think there are some community like cram schools where, peop, uh, where these people might pursue, uh, pursue these kind of decade norms, and um, uh, we think like uh, when pursuing academic, when pe uh, some particular individuals such as people who want to pursue academics, people who want to be doctor or lawyer, get the idea of hard working some point in life. So if they decide to pursue this, uh, pursue them, 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 them themselves, we think that's particularly uh, that will anyway happen, and we think we are oh, oh, totally okay with that. And, last, and last, as lastly, what kind of norm is this? We think, uh, what kind of norm do we support from government bench? We support plur plurality of norm. We do whatever you want, and we think that uh, the collective norm should be something that you should enjoy, and you should do whatever you want, and you should like uh, pursue the life that. You the, uh, pursue the life in which, in the way in which you want to pursue. So, first question: Why do people live, and how should the meaning of their uh, life should be uh, 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 determined? Firstly, we need to recognize that general people live for happiness or self-actualization. The thing is that how you pursue that uh, happiness or how you pursue that satisfaction should be up to individual, up to individual, from individual, and we think that's different from individual, individual, from individual. 
to individuals based on their ideology or based on the value that they have or based on the circumstance they are in. So we think that maybe some people want to enjoy their daily, daily lives. They are satisfied with having decent job. They are okay with having uh, going to decent school, uh, having a family and having children and live a happy life. We think, of course, there are maybe sometimes they may sometimes feel jealous of people having a Ferrari, but we think at the end of the day, this is a happiness or a way of self-actualization that these people decided to have. The point here is there's no reason to force or there's no reason to encourage these people to sacrifice their short-term happiness at the expense at, at for the long-term happiness. But second, secondly, we think at the end of the day, we think long ha Long-term happiness at the expense of short-term happiness doesn't always necessarily mean good. Just because you sacrifice the immediate pleasure or the happiness or desire you have right now, it doesn't mean you benefit from that process. It doesn't mean that you will, uh, you will in consequence, gain the long-term happiness. Or even if you gain the long-term happiness, that will overweigh uh, all the suffering you went through. The point here is we think that accumulation, uh, we think that accum uh, we think that how, how the happiness will be be pursued for this individual is ultimately different, and we cannot assume that uh, all people should sacrifice uh, sacrifice short-term happiness. So to that extent, because we respect the human choice and individuality as a whole, we think ultimate goals should be engaging the life in life or pursuing life in the, the way in which you feel comfortable with or way in with the way in which you feel self-actualized with. But second question, why this norm suppresses some people and eventually makes their lives miserable? We do understand maybe few individuals, a few individuals may not be affected, but we need to talk about vast majorities of individuals who are likely to be affected by this group norm. Firstly, uh, why is this particularly harmful? Firstly, this society is something cruel and miserable, as we all know. Even if you make effort, even if you, you study for like 10 hours every single day, it doesn't mean you, you are guaranteed to succeed. Even if you, uh, if you, even if you, even you, if you work for, hard for, for a majority of individuals, uh, whether you can uh, gain the benefit or gain the success is something that is limited, maybe because of the restriction of how many individuals can join, uh, join the school or gain the uh, activity, maybe because of your individual capability, but it's something that is not determined and something that is not, conc and something that is not in short. For sure. So there is always people who are better than you, and people always compete with each other under this norm, and we think that there are people who are going to face miserable consequences and feel that their, their life didn't have a meaning. But secondly, independent of the result, we think the process to continue to suppress your desire is already always something enslaving and torturous. For example, getting it getting license, entering examiner examination work, for example, shukatsu, you have to make like, like devastating effect. You have to go through different kind of mental dif difficulties and keep uh, keep questioning yourself. Why can't I do this? Why um, be, be very uh, de devastated uh, uh, of this? We, so the point here is the process within itself is something enslaved. And um, third of all, we think collective norm is likely to be created. We think that more people will, uh, more people within their side will pressure you. Why don't you make? Why don't you study hard? Why, uh, like teachers or parents, and pressure you? Why are you not going to this university? Why are you not pursuing to be doctor, for example? So not just uh, even if you, uh, they are going to criticize for you be uh, for you pursuing the choice, uh, pursuing the life in which you want. So we think that pernicious for these individuals. In, in the absence of no, within in outside of the house, we think that these people can enjoy, enjoy their life in the way in which they want. They can still have hobbies where they can find pleasure with. They can still have family and friends who you feel happiness from talking with. So we think that's a totally legitimate choice and totally legitimate way of life. And that's why we are extremely proud to propose. Thank you.
the reason why I debate, why I put so much time in researching or trying to get better debate, is because I think that while debating, I could obtain English skills or I could obtain other kind of skills like you doing ICT and knowing how to organize things and whatnot. We think this kind of skills is something that I could apply to many kind of things when I get a job, or whether I want to get a promotion, or whether I want to go abroad or whatnot. But it's much more easier for me to just not do any research, right? It's much more easier for me to just watch Netflix, or it's much more easy for me to just sleep all day. We think what this norm does is it equalizes the pre-existing norms or the pre-existing inherent desires that we have to prioritize short-term interests. That's why we're very happy to oppose today's motion. So my speech, oh, first, okay, so in my speech, I'm gonna talk about how this is actually better for individuals, how this norm will be an equalizer, and how we're at the end of the day gonna, if people are gonna be in a better state with this norm. But first of all, one clarification, right? We think that just because we have this norm, it doesn't mean it's predominant inside society and we're gonna brainwash everyone to work like slaves or work like robots, right? We think that in, we think that there are already pre-existing norms or desires that people have, right, which I'll further talk on later. So what we think this norm does is we think that it creates an idea at the back of your head, okay, I probably should go to university or I should probably work hard to do specific things or if I get a job, I should probably kind of work hard to get a promotion or make like, myself look like. We think it's that kind of, norm or idea or that kind of lens that you have inside your mind that we're talking about. It's not like we're indoctrinating these individuals. So considering that the first point of how this is an equalizer to human desire for short-term benefit, right? We think in general, people want to inherently want to prioritize the short-term interest for multiple reasons, right? I think it's extremely easy to relate, but first, it's just much more easy to slack off, for example, studying or prioritize your own benefit. Especially if you look at this day and age where it's extremely easy to fulfill your short-term benefit, right? Just opening your computer and just subscribing to Netflix or watching YouTube can make you really, really happy and it's extremely easy to do that, right? Or like those kind of future dreams that you have, it's probably much more easier to think that, okay, I might be a YouTuber or I might be, no, no offense, I might be a YouTuber, or I, want, I want to be an Uber driver. It's much more easier to have that kind of ideal my ideal inside your mind rather than actually prioritizing those long term. The reason why is because long, thinking about the long term, like they said, is kind of difficult, right? You have to do research, you have to kind of obtain your want to sleep, or you have to like, um, you have to study hard, or you have to like confront you, the difficulties that you have inside your life, right? So if you look at the comparative, we think it's much more easier for people to prioritize the short term interests that they have. And especially if you look at children who don't know the holistic image of what they have to do in society. They don't know how they have to live by themselves without their parents. They don't know about the responsibility they have of paying their bills every single month, right? We think in that kind of scenarios, when, the pre, when that kind of interest or, of, or that want to prioritize the short-term interest can, read, can lead to tremendous harm, right? It will create a regret, it will make, in, it will make individuals make regretful decisions and it's extremely difficult to change that, right? Because like, the first of all, the opportunity cost, right? You could go to university, for example, but you could just not go at all, don't get any get credits, and you could fail and not get graduation, no thank you. Recognize in this kind of scenario, the time and money you use for university will never come back, right? And it'll affect your entire life. It'll affect your job career. It might affect your family relationship. You might not be able to get married because you don't have a sustainable income, right? And it's extremely difficult to redo these kind of things. For example, if you don't show that you're socializing inside the corporation and you label that someone who doesn't, you label as someone lazy or people think of you like that, it's extremely difficult to redo these kind of things. Even if you can, it takes lots of time and it takes lots of money. It's extremely difficult when you could have done it much easier. So what happens in our side of the house is that in the back of your mind, you kind of have that idea that, okay, I should probably at least graduate university or I should do job hunting when I'm in my third year. I should probably obtain skills and whatnot, right? And like I, like I hinted in my introduction, we think these skills aren't specific skills, but they could apply to be many, many different kind of things. So for example, English is a good example, right? If you could speak English, you could probably apply to lots of different kind of jobs when you don't have that much high scores on TOEIC, right? We think this adapts to the future dreams that you want to, right? Even though you want to change your career path, or even though you say, okay, I don't want to go to consulting, but I want to do development, you could still use that kind of same skills of organizing or hard work and whatnot, right? So we think it leads to a much more better outcome on our side of the house. But what they said is that, but uh, goals is extremely difficult to actually achieve that, and it's gonna be extremely stressful, right? About goals, firstly, we think those goals are something that you create. You don't have to be the CEO of Amazon. It's probably you who are going to make a goal that fits you the most. Second of all, even if you don't fulfill your goal, we still think this norm nudges people to actually get, learn through the process, right? Even though you don't win a tournament, you can still learn how to work hard, or you can still learn the skills or the process, or you can know what you're good at or whatnot, right? So we think that process of you going through this kind of hardship is actually better. Second of all, we think it's equalizing to pre-existing norms in specific regions before the time you do it. 
working hard and working at a level at the significant reduction and negligence of your immediate desires, desires is very different. Why does it have to be working hard to that level? Um, like we said, we're this, notion, this notion is not indoctrinating people to do whatever. If people think that maybe resting a little bit will actually enhance my efficiency in the long term, then that is, a leg that is okay in our side of the house too, right? Second of all, we think there are pre-existing norms in specific areas. Right? For example, in conservative reasons, it might be the norm that women should just not use education, but should just get married. Or it could be in rural areas where it seems kind of docile to go to university or that you should just get a job, right? Or in blue-collar workers or in poor rural areas where their family is all having zero-hour contract, we think children who grow up in these areas have um, people who they learn from the society, they learn from their parents, or they learn from the lifestyle that their friends have. The harm here is that they are go they might be going in a track that they don't really want to, right? For example, they think it's normal to actually get married, or they think to marry to someone you don't like, or they think it's normal not to pursue education because that's the norm around them, right? So they just do things that they don't want to do, right? It's difficult, extremely difficult to redo those kind of things. We think in these kind of areas, especially the most vulnerable people in society, what this norm does is that it sheds a light to these people and gives them different kind of options, right? It's not just the norms inside your community that says you have to be submissive to men. It's also that you could value education and that you could use, as long as you have these kind of skills, then you could actually maximize your kind of benefits that you have inside society, right? So we think in these kind of scenarios, we think that even though this norm isn't like the dominant thing, it actually equalizes and enhances people to get better choice, right? So if you look at the comparative, let's take the best case scenario, and even though there is some kind of short-term happiness. First of all, we think on the comparative, or said the house has more happiness, right, if that's quantifiable, because in their side of the house, they could only get that happiness while they're watching Netflix or while they're not studying. On our side of the house, if you get that one promotion or if you're able to have that skill, you can maximize that happiness for the rest of your life, right? That kind of self-confidence and whatnot. And also on the content, also on like the, actually no, yeah. So you know, if you look at the comparative, we think our side of the house actually maximizes individual's happiness. For those reasons, we're very happy to close. I thank Chris Pitcher, I'd like to invite the second speaker from the Senate of Government. Yeah. There is a bizarre misunderstanding about career advancement and how general people perceive jobs. People do jobs not often because they really like that job, but because they have to do it. It's often that we work hard because we think it's necessary, not because we really enjoy it. We have the skills, we have the job, but we don't really enjoy it. And to be told that you should work hard and it was very tough, you had to abandon all your hobbies, your parents kind of scrapped all the things they want, you were condemned for watching Star Wars on Sunday, and all these kind of stresses are left, but you have all those skin skills, but you might eventually not like it. The only thing that was motivating you was that it was something that you had to do necessary, and it was necessary because there was a demand, it was a defining decade that was pushing you to do that. Then, what is left? You didn't really like what you're doing. You have a sense of abandonment, that you simply forgot what you really wanted to do. You feel that you are not in a position that you should be in, and once again, there was a paranoia that the defining decade, and you should have acted at the expense of the immediate desire. And looking once again at general people, we as debaters, unfortunately, are in a very prestigious position with all these news media reading and the good university. That's not the majority story of the world. People often, again, with high school, people just go a decent job and enjoy surfing and whatever they do. They enjoy camping, whatever, and that's part of their life. Job is just something that's doing necessary. For these people, to pressure them to say that you should be working hard, your important part of leisure and life is meaningless and is sinful, is a toxic narrative. And why we think that this narrative might be good for debaters, but it's not the general norm that we should advocate for. I'll be talking about two things. First, I'll be talking about a bit more on what this narrative would be me meaning to people. We think that it's a never-ending haunting because promotion, all your career opportunities, is a never-lasting story. Second, I'll be talking about the communal pressures that are created through this norm because it's about other people telling you that you should be working hard. Your parents telling you you should be working hard because these parents might be the young adults that indicated an info site and they want their children to be following. It is your managers doing this and that's kind of a toxic, haunting environment they will be surrounded where you have no escape. Rebuttals before I go on. First, they said, well, working hard is awesome and it's gonna be something meaningful. We said, well, then it's actually just about working hard, not about the, at the exclusion of your immediate desires and hobbies. 
Like you can balance your hobbies and work hard. Like this is this about working like studying four hours a day versus studying like eight hours a day? Imagining that we are trying to get in a university exam like back, back in a few years, like as I said, these university students. And they never thought that's why it was necessary to that level. And then they, then they said, well, it's good that people can reasonably interpret the norm. Then they're supporting a narrative that not the defining decade, but just working hard reasonably. Effectively, they are not opposing the motion or supporting the norm, so I'm not sure what they're talking about. They need to talk about the uniqueness, necessity of that norm. And that's important because reasonably, people do balance it because they know their duty is important, they know their tasks are necessary, but they also want to do safe things. And they gradually learn if that's the, because that's how living works. We want to enjoy things, but we also do such things that are necessary. So the balancing is a natural thing that people learn instinctively. But they say it should be a defining norm, we should push more. Then I'm not sure why their world is better. Second, they say it's just the norm, it's not going to proliferate. Uh, we think it's not true. This is a particularly strong norm, even if we concede that it is just a norm. Why is it so? Because it clearly says it is a defining decade. It is a moment that we should act. It is a decade that we need to act as a collective, and we should be standing up for that change. It also implies that it's a collective we should be moving. It's, uh, like, it seems like something important, which means that it kind of makes you believe that others should be doing and the others should be joining it, but also it suggests that it's something really important, so I should help them by making them realize that they should be working hard and important. So it's kind of a toxic narrative that it proliferates by itself. And it's, you know, this narrative is kind of correct, because working hard is kind of correct. So it's hard to refute, and it's something that people easily want to spread, because they'll be talking about good stories of working hard. So it's a narrative particularly that easily proliferates and is motivated on a defining sense that we must and should go on, so why it's kind of proliferating. Then they said, you know, Netflix, you know, you're wasting your time. Why? I'm enjoying my life. That is good. Second, <laughs> we think that if you need to do something at expense once again, you will do it. Thirdly, conceding, or they concede, that lazy people don't act necessarily. Meaning that some people might be able to become this awesome person and go on, but most people just get this pressure and still be lazy. That's how human psychology works. Which means that you don't really get any benefit for these people, but just tell them that you are wrong. You're kind of simple, and I kind of feel that I'm wrong for doing it. Your relatives, parents tell you that it's wrong. Your friends tell you it's wrong. It's just making their environment kind of suffocating, no real salvation, and you don't have the grit and the motivation to be able to maybe move yourself because you're lazy. So there is no benefit to these people, or at least a majority characterization, because once again, we're not talking about elite people who has a culture of studying hard, or incentive or reason to study hard. Okay. Then, they said, you cannot redo. But generally, we think, um, people have a stable job. Like even in America, the employment index is quite good. People are able to have a decent wage and hobbies, and that's a general characterization of story in our world. So you don't have to really do like really hard things to succeed. You can have a decent life, and you can go on with it. They assume that they, you know, they, you're in a vulnerable position and they could be abandoned, but that's just a part of people. Why these part of people who might be able to internalize effectively was to taunt everyone to say that we should be working hard and denying the liberty and the freedom that we want. We think that it's an unjustifiable compatibility because once again, generally people are okay with a bit low wage in rural areas enjoying surfing and going on with popcorn whatsoever because once again, we are not talking about debaters. Um, commun uh, communal pressure. Uh, sorry, um, lasting effect. So, well, ultimately, in their world, they will be working hard, but even get, they get promoted. But still, you can promote more, you can look for more scaling opportunities. It's a never lasting thing. Probably, we do this because it's going to be a salvation, but it still continues. So there's no end to it, and there's more pressure, more hard work, more hard work, more hard work. There's, it's just not going to be a liberation on this hand, otherwise it's bad. On communal pressure, as I talked about, this is about young adults, but easily extends to children because it's also before adults, and these young adults might be the parents of these children, which means it creates, it's part of the culture of excessive cram schooling, like we see in Korea and Japan, where people suicide, and the pressure that children cannot opt out because they are enforced to do it, and it seems that it's a definitive norm that parents and drownings are telling you that there's no way out. It also extends to corporations, because managers are these kind of defining decade kind of persons, so they impose a managerial style to tell that they should be working hard. So they force people to work over over time. They condemn people for just leaving at the at five thirty, etc. They condemn people for not delivering the best that they can or more than the previous month. That is unnecessary and created a toxic environment where people don't really want to because job is just for living. So these managers are just being too excessive, serious, geeky, and we don't want that. 
<laughs> geeky people can be geeky, but that's not what everyone wants. And we want to relax, and I want to drink beer today after I get distracted. <laughs> So I would like to extend the negative statement to the first one, and then I further extend and analyze the individual impact uh, of the existence of this farm. And second of all, I'm going to extend my partner's analysis on how this affects society, especially communities impoverished and communities that, uh, in general, has the norm that counters, actually counters this particular norm. So before that, two points of rebuttal. So first of all, they talk about how even if without this norm, individuals know, uh, generally speaking, know the importance of hard work. So as a consequence of that, that they will be able to balance the hard working aspect of their life and the hobby aspect of their life, the lazy aspect of their life. Now, it seems that they don't really, uh, they don't really oppose what we are actually supporting. We believe the individual ultimately should be able to balance out the harder working aspect of their life and their laziness aspect of their life. But what we say is that unless this particular norm exists somewhere in our society, it is very easy for people to slip and prioritize the short-term desire and pleasure, their hobby aspect of their life, and not see the long working hard aspect of their life. Because generally speaking, we believe that people are short-sighted. We believe that it is very easy to visualize and actually see the direct benefit that you can receive from short-term pleasure, whereas it is very difficult to actually imagine what that hard work would pay off. Like, uh, uh, like imagine whether you, like, who you're going to marry, what kind of family you're going to have, what kind of job you're going to have, and what, why is being being promoted beneficial? Like it is very difficult, especially for young teenagers, to actually visualize that and imagine that and understand that concretely to be able to balance that out. That is why we need a norm saying that generally speaking, it is better that you make an effort, it is better that you plan in the long term. Furthermore, like the ba basic premise of today's affirmative case was to like it was an over exaggeration of the norm. Like we don't, they basically said this norm is so pervasive, it is so oppressive, uh, because in the motion it says defining norm, defining decade. Just because the word says defining does not necessarily mean that the norm is necessarily oppressive or dominant or it harms people in any meaningful way. Well, for example, especially in today's Japanese society, look at Japanese society right now. The job revolution, I don't know how to say in English, but job revolution is now the trendy norm in Japan society. It's not that trendy anymore to like work like, like uh, uh, that in, in the point that you actually undermine your health, right? But moreover, more relevantly and more importantly, we believe that certain communities in our society, as my partner mentioned, impoverished, for example, black communities in the United States, that this particular norm, it unfortunately, is not dominant. It's not pervasive in that community. But moreover, it doesn't even exist. Because when you see your brother or your friends or your father, all of them just are, are so pessimistic in saying that no matter how hard you work or how hard, hard you study, you won't be able to get a college. You won't be able to get a job. And that is the pervasive norm in that particular community. So in that particular community, we at least need this particular norm shared in our society so that those individual young teenage African-American uh, children will be able to somehow have some sort of support of their incentive to work hard and incentive to study hard, ladies and gentlemen. So it's not a, the, a, a pervasive norm that we support. We support a counterbalancing norm that counters other, any other factors and norms. Not yet. So let's move on to the individual aspect of today's debate. What we heard from their side of the uh, house is that the vast majority of people feel so pressured by this norm because there are people, but there are people who live like humble life and have 
happy with your family and the, the, who suffer psychological pressure from this particular norm. And we don't think that this norm is so oppressive uh, as they characterize. And the reason why that is the case is that people's choice is not absolutely defined or it is absolutely determined by the norm that society shares. Factors such as simple biological desire, social desire, factors such as how people around you are acting and how you actually perceive that, like fa uh, factors how, how, how you have made your choice in the past. All of those aspects are also uh, factors which decide individual choice, and we don't think that this norm, the, just because this norm exists does not necessarily mean that people are indoctrinated and lobotomized to the point that they automatically make certain decisions. But second of all, people's reaction to, like even if this norm is pervasive, we don't think that people's reaction to this norm is universal because it depends on that person's characteristic. For example, right now, the society basically shares a general norm that being healthy is good. That norm doesn't like apply to me at all. It doesn't pressurize me at all because I don't care what the society really think about me. Because you can't assume that people would like unanimously react same, uh, similarly and assume that that is necessarily harmful. But third of all, like even if you want to live a humble life, it is probably preferential and probably better that you at the same time think in the long term. It is probably preferential for you to save up money, money in case you or your family get sick and ha has to be hospitalized. It is probably preferential for you to seek a promotion at least, like not become like a CEO, but to get like better salary so you can provide more uh, uh, financial support for your children for your college, uh, college tuition. And this is the reason why this is the case is because life is full of unexpectancy. Like it is better to pr plan in the long term. It is better to ready yourself in the long term because through life people meet many financial uh, uncertainty, many so social uncertainty, and it's basically better to plan in the long term because it makes you more robust to those unexpected situations. Sure. So why don't you support a norm like do your homework, do your work as necessary, and balance it? Like, you seem to support a norm that you don't want people to fully internalize, and I don't get that. No, no, that's exactly the norm that we are support. We're, we're supporting people to try to work hard, but not to the point that you, they destroy themselves. But fourthly, like, you can still be lazy in our world. Like, like but in, in our world, at least you have a norm that says, like, oh, it's, okay to be, it's okay to be lazy right now at this point, but it's probably better for you to, have, like, after you get one hour of laziness, you start studying for your exam just you have next week. It doesn't mean you have to study 10 hours every day, like they say, but maybe you should be preferential that you study two, three days a week. But moreover, the psychological harm is not mutually exclusive, right? A person can live a happy life being lazy in the short term, but later on, when they see their friends like getting a good job, getting a promotion, being successful in this particular field, they feel a sense of like regret. They feel a sense of jealousy. So negative psychological harm is not mutually exclusive. It also ex ex uh, exists in their world. So ultimately, we have to make a comparison between the short-term pleasure versus the long-term benefit that we propose. And there's three uh, 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 criteria to assess this. The first is in terms of quantity. As the word short-term benefit implies, short-term is only a temporary benefit, whereas long-term, if you get a good job, if you get a promotion, that benefit will last a longer time, 20, 30 years in some cases. So in terms of quantity, this is better. But second, uh, quantity, second, quality. Like, like it is true that short-term pleasure is good, but short-term pleasure is also ultimately a pleasure that you receive from someone. It is more like fulfilling, more happy that you have, the happiness that you have created is that one that you have achieved, and that creates more self-confidence in that sense. So ultimately, in terms of quality and quantity, we believe that individuals should prioritize this aspect of their life, and that is why the motion must go. Presentation locks in by the quick takeoff from the offensive. Hey, hey. Just please read the info slide. This 
debate is about significantly suppressing and neglecting yourself and your immediate desire. It's not just about, you know, do your homework and the rest of the time is yours. That's kind of different narrative they are trying to advocate for under that side of the house. Even if they want to balance out the lazy people, firstly, why do they go to this the extreme end of the spectrum just because some people are lazy? Just encourage them to do your homework. Do you think that's okay? I think that when they talk about these lazy people on the ground, it doesn't have to be that much significantly regret, like, neglecting these people's own self. Yeah, that's too oppressive, and or, or even if admit that these people are super lazy, these people do not want to like, subscribe to this narrative. Those people do uh, get too exhausted, too tired, two days after they try to subscribe to that. No meaningful difference under the side of the house about these lazy people whatsoever. I'm going to talk about three things. Firstly, about life. Secondly, about what this narrative actually does. Lastly, about let's talk about these lazy people on the ground, right? But, um, okay, so about life. So <laughs> at, at the end of the day, we have continuously questioned to their side of the house, why do people have to work so hard? The only possible response from Elo, I think, was that we're going to maximize the happiness. But the thing is that, who decides that maximum happiness, right? But who decides that the ultimate end goal of becoming a doctor and so on, even at the expense of all the accumulation of your happiness through the way, is actually be better for that specific individual? No one can decide. Look, they, they said, children don't know, so we have to nudge that. Children don't know. Children don't even aspire to become a doctor. What's the justification for those people to encourage these people? Uh, children who don't know nothing about know nothing about life to sacrifice their immediate desire even if they want to play some game even if want to they want to play soccer at, uh, at school ground uh, I think that inextricably is a harm but at the end of the day again maximizing happiness is a very vague concept and they haven't established yet why their lifestyle should be pursued for the people second let's look about what this narrative actually does because I think like they went for this the tactic of, well, not all people are affected, so that's okay. For, first of all, not, if not all people are affected, if only a small bracket of these very lazy people are affected, well, I don't think this policy is actually necessary, as I told you in the introduction. But secondly, if very few people who they are talking about are those people who are have some kind of very, very good goal, like winning the walls, but still, like, like, something like you know, very hard, uh, struggling because they're kind of inevitably lazy, like me, um, these people learn from the people around them, like choosing the role model, and they try to go for it. And like, if they hear a story about Mayu prepping from 7:30 every fucking morning in order to win the world, <laughs> probably if the succeeding, uh, if, if the people who come after that want to become like Ari Mayu, they could probably do the same thing, like pursue their own happiness. That's their own choices, not the ones that is encouraged through this norm. That's the critical difference here, ladies and gentlemen, because you are doing it. Again, children on the side of the house don't know that those things. If they don't know, why do you need it? They don't aspire to win the world. They don't even aspire to become the president or the doctor, go to the good university whatsoever. Maybe they, maybe they don't need it. But the, in the rural areas, they say they are confined. They are forced to believe that they don't have re to reach out the better education. They don't. That they are kind of confined to the idea of marrying a good guy and having the rest of life in a peaceful manner. Again, why is it bad, right? Because do we do understand that people have less choices? But the thing is that there are some more narratives that encourages these people to go to a good university. That's not the thing that inextricably encourages them to sacrifice their own self because. Glorifying the exact role model of universities, for instance, is kind of different from glorifying the extreme ways to achieve that, right? I think that kind of role models around them is kind of enough to like, make them, make some, some of them at least, to break the glass ceilings or whatever and aspire for a better life. And if they choose to aspire for the better life, then they need to work hard, but that's their choice, not relevant to this norm in and of itself. We think that's a completely different story under that side of the house. And we well, told you from the second speaker that logic, why this tends to expand to the people, not only the people who are very, very lazy under that side of the house, but also the people who are kind of moderate, also the people who are getting the decent job and having decent hobby and, you know, having decent life. All of those people are affected, considering the fact that we are seeing increasing trends of competition, like cram school culture, and all of those competition in job applications. See, how many people of you have started job like job hunting process, right? I think that many people have started early and early and early, and pressure is so, so high. And the trend is that 
this culture of continuous self-sacrifice and continue to pursue, continuing to pursue the end goal on the last side of the house is likely to expand to people who used to be irrelevant and who used to be like non, not needing the that kind of end goal in and of itself. So we think that the expansion and this norm affecting people on the ground is significantly bad. And then they told you. Anyway, you choose your goal. So it will be kind of feasible goal. No one wants to be the president of the United States of America, of course. But things that, first of all, this norm not only encourages you to aspire for kind of like realistic goal, but also to encourage you to aspire for more. If you win the win the certain tournament, the next question you will get is, oh, what's the next tournament you're uh, you're attending, right? So that is what they do, ladies and gentlemen. And if you you are kind of unable to be satisfied. At the result, at your point of that, and also notice that many people compete for the exact same kind of goal, even if that goal is not the top goal, right? Many people compete for many kinds of job applications. For instance, many universities do have entrance examinations, and the thing is that if you succeed, congratulations. But the vast majority of people do not get the result they originally wanted. Then, if they say. Well, anyway, it's going to be useful in the future. But if it's not going to be useful in the future, what what do you do? I mean, not all people can utilize exact the same kind of knowledge and experiences for other kind of like you know vector, right? That's kind of impossible. And lastly, about lazy people, I kind of rebutted that enough, but again, they're equalizing the stuff. Um, why do you need this much of an extreme narrative? In order to encourage some very very lazy people to do something, if their standard is so low that they don't even do daily homework, just encourage them to do daily homework. That is enough, ladies and gentlemen. If they are talking about people who have have great dream and still not able to achieve that, these people do not need this narrative because those people do have their own will to achieve that, and probably around them there will be successors. There will be many people who have achieved that. There will be many narratives encourage them to do hard work. At the end of the day, they haven't shown us why this narrative is uniquely necessary in our society. We propose. <laughs> Thank you, Chairperson. It seems that they are escaping the debate by defending very naive and soft position. We are more than happy to defend both extreme scenario and moderate scenario. That's what I would like to answer in my speech by asking two questions. First of all, about pressure and expectation, the basic concept that they have presented in the debate. Secondly, impact over the vast majority of the public. But that's the character they want to defend. So let's move, move on to the first question about pressure and expectation. The Prime Minister Tosha explained that the effort is always enslavement. The process of making effort is painful. Our first battle is even under Yomoro, as they considered, you have to work anyway. You have to do something about maintaining your subsistence anyway. Maybe you have to work in some jobs. You have to go to school at some point. But the difference is, if we believe that harsh reality continues to exist, what's the difference? What does norm does is it enables people to positively interpret such a process and impart the meaning in such a daily boring process. So finding the meaning is the only way to remove and dilute the sense of pain and predicament from your efforts. And that is a unique advantage of having this narrative. Second rebuttal is considering that in a realistic context, harsh reality, you have to work anyway, you have to go to school anyway. In a context in which harsh reality oh, anyway exists, regrets hurt you more. The sense that you could have made efforts, but you didn't. You took a nihilistic stance about your shukatsu job hunting and life and capitalism and you indulge yourself and now you have nothing to be proud of. Remember your childhood. Maybe your parents, parents urged you to study. But why? What was the intent? That because many parents know that if they had studied or if they had made more efforts, their life would be more useful, more wonderful, and more meaningful. That's the incentive why many parents urge their children to spare their time and resources for that. So the comparison here is even under their model, even if they support the plurality of choice model, harsh reality or plural reality continue to exist that hurts you, even if you take an atheistic stance, regrets 
consequentially or eventually had to. At least under a model, under our paradigm, it, this narrative enables individuals to mitigate such a kind of a sense of a regret and reduce mental harm associated with the sense of regret. Final rebuttal about it is about losers. That's what uh, the previous speaker explained. There are some losers in a competition. Not everybody is able to get promoted. Not everybody is able to make achievement. So assumption, hidden premise of their case is that objective result and achievement is the only value. Not really, ladies and gentlemen, not really. Even if you don't make objective achievement, even, you, even if you don't become a champion of the tournament, the fact that you spare your energy and efforts gives you a confidence, a unique subjective experience, experiences that no other people are able to give you. And that's the point here. There are many professional sports players in our society, in our world. Not everybody is able to become the champion or Olympic representative athlete. Not everybody in this tournament is able to become the champion. But why people are so motivated or so enthusiastic about making efforts? Because the fact that they spare resources gives a unique personalized confidence to that person and that experience is irreversible and irreplaceable. Shikara asks, what's left? This is the answer. You have gained your experiences, you have gained your personal subjective experiences and uh, confidence. And that's why this is necessary. And this analysis clashes with what Prime Minister Toshi has explained, that we need to defend the plurality or diversity of choices. Yes, uh, that's not mutually exclusive. Emphasizing your individual interpretation or personalized uh, efforts and responsibility or constructive attitudes is possible on our side of the house as well. No, thank you. It's not like one monopolistic role model hijacks and dictates every single person's motivation and value judgment. The norm enables you to elevate yourself within your possible reach, and that's a realistic uh, interpretation of our narrative for vast majority of people. By the way, uh, the previous speaker explained that he is influenced by his friends, like Arimayo. If that's the case, even under the real side of the house, you are not able to make you are not able to make your rational decision based on your free choices and free will. You are subject to influences by so many authoritative people or charismatic people around you. We mean that's far more uh, problematic. It infringes you to make your rational, personalized decision, and that's the conclusion of this debate. Go ahead. Again, what makes you believe that the confidence you get out of it is compatible with the sacrifices you have made all through? Firstly, that is because you need to make a sacrifice anyway in our harsh reality. Because at least you have to go to school and spare eight hours in school or office. Like, you know, or otherwise maybe you uh, receive library protection, but you at least need to uh, make some sort of attitude in order to continue to get library protection from the state. If that's the case, ladies and gentlemen, only way for everybody to overcome such a sense of misery is to gain subjective personal confidence and experience. That's why my second partner have explained it in this debate. So moving on, moving on to the second question about the impact of general poverty. Firstly, the Shikara explained that our, our case does not support the, this motion because we are only supporting the norm of working hard but not excluding desire. No, my partner explained the answer for that. In general, as they have considered, public have general tendency to indulge themselves. People are not strong, people are not brave enough, people are not so like, enthusiastic enough. That is why without this norm, it's very likely that people have propensity to prioritize short-term tangible uh, pleasure. That is why we believe the existence of this counter narrative is important. Moral and Chika explained that we need to balance things out. We can balance hobby and working. If people have the ability to balance out everything, then those people uh, still exist in India on the outside of the house as well. So it's not like people will go over talk and overwork and get exploited and commit suicide. If people have the ability to balance out, then the problem that they have explained will also be diluted. Secondly, self-proliferation mechanism, that Chikala explained. We believe that is exaggeration, but even if that happens, that is good. Self-proliferation mechanism is the only way to reach out the vast majority of people living in an impoverished area in which the ignorance is a predominant cultural norm. That is to say, parents and communities see no value in going to school, no value in making efforts to uh, go up in the social ladder. For those communities, self-proliferation mechanism is the only way to, uh, to motivate the least well-off to see some uh, wish in the future. Finally, about never-ending story. He said, your manager doesn't seem happy. Don't label him unhappy. We need to celebrate that because for him, that is great and unique decision. 
And moreover, uh, it, it, it's not like people will lose all choices. If you don't like your manager, maybe you have an option to opt up your company and find the next company that matches your preferences. That's what I have been doing in my life. I started my own business because this uh, matches my preferences, but I don't stop making efforts at all. We are happy to help. Thank you. <laughs> by showing how people are going to be affected by this law. I'm going to show how it's not that bad as government wants to portray. I'm going to talk about how it's actually going to nudge people in a better way. So what did we hear from Gov? Gov said, okay, this norm is going to be have put lots of pressure on individuals. It's going to be extremely stressful. They're going to have lots of sacrifices or whatnot. We talked about how it's not necessarily always stressful. It's not always necessarily a sacrifice, right? Even though you don't achieve your goal, that process of actually learning that might actually gain something for you. You might learn something for that. Or like what Mita san said, at the end of the day, you probably have to go through that process sometime in your life, right? So we don't really think it's that bad. But second of all, we think that the cases that they're trying to illustrate as the harms are actually the extreme minority cases, right? Because we think the people that they're talking about are people who already have the mindset that they have to really, really work hard. In addition to that, that norm comes in, right? So we think what they're talking, they're talking about the spectrum, the very right of the spectrum of where people are already intense. And we think in those kind of scenarios, those kind of people are probably going to start like self-blaming themselves or they're still going to have that pressure on themselves. So we think about the number of people that's harmed, it's not that big. But in the comparative, what did we talk about? We talked about like how people are in, how people are inherently lazy or try to prioritize short-term interests. Recognize that maybe really, really, really lazy people won't be affected by this norm. But we're trying what we're trying to talk here is we're, we're trying to say about the moderate cases of people who tend to prioritize their self-interest or short-term interest, right? We think that these people are. Uh, we told we told you about how it's difficult to visualize that kind of suffer, that kind of hard work that you do for the long term benefit, or just more easier in this day and age to actually fulfill those kind of interests. From Gov, we heard about why is why does it have to be uniquely this narrative, right? Well, first of all, they didn't tell us how we could do it with other narratives. But second of all, we think this narrative is not just simply do your homework narrative. It's about making the best out of the opportunities that you have and having that perspective, a long term perspective, right? So we think we gave that uniqueness. But second of all, they talk about why does it have to be to this extent? Why does it have to be strong, so strong? First of all, we told you that it's not coercive where they're literally brainwashed, right? We talked about how it's something in the back of their head where they think, okay, I have this kind of option. But second of all, even if it's that bad, we think we, even though it's really strong, we think that's the only way to actually nudge people, right? Because usually if this is like 100% narrative, people won't act according to that. They'll probably integrate those kind of things and probably act half of it because they're still kind of lazy, right? So we think even if it's extremely strong, we think the effects that people have are going to be diluted and it's not going to be that bad as we talked about. And recognize that they never engage with the harms that we talked about when individuals prioritize their short-term interests, right? Not going to university when you could have just studied five hours a day and you could have got that, right? Or prioritizing you being an Uber driver when you could have actually got, for example, like other kind of skills or degrees or whatnot, or even asking or negotiating with your, or working hard to get a promotion, right? All these things are quite, we talked we talk about these are important, firstly because you could regret that choice and never go back to high school, you could never go back because of time and money constraints. But second of all, we talked about how life is extremely unpredictable, at least on our side of the house, when you have a little bit of money, you could you won't starve to death, or you could at least still let your child go to university as long as you're in a proper company or you get proper welfare, right? So we think in those kind of scenarios, we take the debate. But if you look on the comparative, we still think um, no. But second of all, we also another argument that was completely ignored by them was about how specific conflicts there are pre-existing norms that are extremely strong, like poor communities or conservative areas, where the idea of going to university itself is absurd, or the idea of women trying to actually get a job or ask for promotion is absurd, right? In these kind of cases, the norms that you should actually value this 
kind of education or your life term, long term perspective is non existent. They said, oh, but they can learn from people around them. People around these communities are your family or your friends who are probably on zero hour contracts. They don't have a long term. They make fun of people who go to university, right? They have no options but to follow that because that is their life and that's what they only know. If we have these norms, for example, a teacher asks them, why don't you go to university? Or they see on the TV about there is this kind of prospect in the future. They have much more options and they could actually have a career path that they want to do to achieve what they want to do in the future. For these reasons, we think this norm is extremely important to nudge people in the correct, dire correct direction. For those reasons, proud to oppose. All right, thanks for your speech. And lastly, I'm going to invite the response speaker from the front tip to close the case. Hey, hey. So, two questions. Firstly, how would this norm operate? Second, do we need this norm? So, we told you a lot of reasons to believe that this norm is a strong one and would be proliferated. It is written. It's a defining thing. It is something, something that urges you to act. It is something that seems right, so it's hard to refute. It is something that you would want to recommend others to also follow for the sake of this being collectivized, but also because you believe that others should also follow because you feel that it's beneficial. And because it's, once again, hard to refute it, and it seems right, you kind of just are flushed away and become a kind of a strong norm. Not the dominant or definitive thing, but it will become likely a strong one. Their response was like, nothing to this logic. They just said, it won't happen. Like, people reasonably do this. It's going not, not going to be oppressive. Why? They said, like from reply, that we need to balance it. Sorry. <laughs> they just said, it's going to be like, people are able to balance it. But why? The point is, if they want to balance that, it just has to be that balancing norm. And they just say, this would work too, but they haven't told us this is better than just a reasonable narrative of just hard, just work hard, do your homework, etc. They ultimately never told us why this norm was ultimately crucial necessary and the only thing that was ultimately important, but also why this would not be a proliferating one. And we told you numerous harms assuming that it would proliferate, that people who do not want to work would be cursed by their managers, their friends, that your idle time is a waste. You watching Star Wars on Sunday is a sin. You eating popcorn at your home and relaxing is wrong, and you should be dragged out of your house, and you should be working 12 hours at the expense of your sleeping time. And they're okay with that, for some reason. And the response is that, well, you will hard work anyway, which is not engaging to nuance, because working four hours for some license and working at the expense of sleeping time and hobby is very, very different. The level of stress you would have to endure, the level of hardship when you cannot even relieve your stress and you have to still do it is horrible. And why you are forcing that on your narrative, I'm not sure what they're talking about. And when also you create that pressure and the only response is that you can change your corporation, you still had to abandon the corporation because of this toxic norm. You can see the fact that these people were forced to be kicked out of the communities that they were associated to because some people turned into these high, motivated, geeky people because of this definite norm, and I do not see a response. So ultimately, they just tried to wash away the benefit but did not tell us why it was really worth it. So we think it would proliferate. But let's talk about the benefits that they, they might have. So do we need this norm? So ultimately, they just want to motivate the people. And we said that people can naturally in, like, you know, manage the jobs that they want or the tasks that they have. And they, once again, just say that this would work. But OK, this might work. But why is this reasonable narrative that people can build not sufficient? Why do we have to have this additional norm for people to be motivated to that level? They don't want to get this career. They don't want to get this license. Why do they need that? They say that you know they might be able to learn awesome things and get confidence out of it. But if they fail the license exam and feel that the four hours they worked were a waste, would they feel value in it? If they were just motivated because they feel the compulsion to work and they just get the position and feel that they are bad in something important, would they feel the value of that? We already told you from, from Toshiya and myself, and there was all the new system responses were dismissive. But ultimately, we think, like, we didn't need this norm. It's just that you try to motivate lazy people, but once again, lazy people might not be motivated. They just haunt them and curse them, which they have never responded to. And they said people can be able to prepare, but once again, why is that important? Because generally, people are enjoying an okay life. Not a high wage, but just enjoying camping and surfing, that they're okay with it. There's no clear context or necessity for the preparation they talk about, but ultimately, when they also talk about some vulnerable communities that should be urged because of cultural ignorance, 
That is relevant to that community, but as we have clearly said, this is a debate about the general norms that would influence general people in society, where in that context it might matter, but when talking about general people that enjoy drinking beer at home and just balancing the work that they have, which they don't really care about, and just enjoy their hobbies and friends with their family, we don't need this. <laughs>